Y'all ready to hear the word? It's good. I'm ready to preach it. Who has your Bibles with you? Let me see them. Let me see folks that got Bibles. Put them cell phones down. Can't do nothing with no cell phone. I'm sorry, my battery. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But you a good old Bible, man. The Bible says to hide this thing in your heart so that you do not sin against God. Amen. If you got your Bibles, turn to Acts. That's in the New Testament. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. Acts chapter 3, to be more specific. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. It's one of my favorite um, stories in the Bible. I should actually say his story because it's not a fairy tale. This really happened. This is history right here that we're reading. When you got it, say, got it. Good. Let me see here. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10 read like this. It says, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a crippled man from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. I like that. It says, so the man gave them his attention expecting to get something from them. I love this, this line that Peter spits right here. This is like one of those famous lines you hear in the Bible a lot, but you might not know where it comes from. This is where it comes from. And Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. It's a good place to say amen. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up and instantly, somebody say instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. That's good. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to, somebody say used to, who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they, somebody say they, I love it, it doesn't say and he, it says and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So good. Man, that's some good verses right there. I almost want to read it again because it was so good. No, I won't do it. You should go home and read it yourself, though. It's really good. If you're taking notes tonight, um, I've just entitled this message something very, very simple. And it's not like an aha moment. It just is what it is. So give what you got. Give what you got. Sorry if my grammar is not correct. I apologize. Just like the way it sounds. Give what you got. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for each and every person that has decided in their heart to be in this house tonight. God, before the earth began to spin on this axis, you knew each and every person that was going to be in this room tonight. You're not surprised by who showed up. They might be surprised by you. You're not surprised by them. I pray that I would lie down as you rise up. Don't let these words be my own, but let them come directly from your throne room of grace. God, I pray that hearts, minds, and ears are open and receptive to Jesus tonight. Pray that by the time it's all said and done, somebody knows Jesus. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, and everybody set. Everybody set. Give Jesus Christ one more shout of praise in this place. So excited for you to be here tonight. We're in this third part of this series at the Rendezvous that we've been doing all November long called Bless Up. Bless Up. The first week I came up here and I talked about blessed words. How the things that you say to people really matter. People come and go out of your life. They may not last, but the things that they say do. Encouragement that is given to you can last forever. And we wrote letters to people that needed encouragement. And we just want to believe that in their deepest, darkest times, they can open up those letters and just know how amazing God truly created them to be. 
Last week, let's give it up for Pastor Jonathan. He, uh, <laughs> he preached an amazing word called blessed to bless. Blessed to bless. And I love the nugget that he gave us is that you find a blessing in your boldness. When you step out. When you do things that you are called to do, in spite of how you may feel, there's a blessing on the other side of that fear. When you're bold enough to step out, you are blessed, but not only that, you are blessed to bless. And honestly, being a blessed to be a blessing is really the crutch of this entire series. This is not just a series about being thankful. It's a series about paying your thankfulness forward. I'm always grateful to Jesus for all the things I've done. And in the first week, I really tried to break down what blessing really means. And I love blessing because you are blessed in spite of who you are. Some people think they got to, like, do stuff to get blessed. No, you're a child of God. You're blessed. God's right now saying, you're welcome. (laughs) You're blessed. You don't have to earn blessing. You can't earn blessing. You don't have to be blessing. You can't be blessing. Jesus is blessing. You are blessed. So I love the context of what I want to talk about today because what I'm going to talk about this evening really takes all this talk about blessing and really puts action to it. See, I love this story that we read about Peter and John. They are uh, disciples disciples of Jesus. Jesus has already died on the cross at this point. He has already risen from the grave. He has already shown himself to the world, to many different people that he has risen. He showed the nail-scarred hands. He showed the nail-scarred feet. And then eventually, he finally looked at his disciples, and then he ascended to heaven, and he says, hey, I'm going to send you something. I got some backup that I'm sending down. As I exit, I'm going to make sure that you have all the power you need because I'm going to give you something called the Holy Spirit. And we already know what happened. They went up into the upper room and they prayed about 120 of them, the disciples, along with the mothers and the grandmas and the kids. And they prayed in a hot, sweaty room for days and days and days on end. And finally, the Holy Spirit came like a sound that was like a mighty rushing wind. And tongues of fire were dancing on people's heads. And, man, they started speaking in languages that were uh, 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 not culturally known to the people that were actually speaking them. They they spoke in other tongues. Some of them were even heavenly languages. And the people down that were at the bottom listening to these people up in the upper room was like, man, these dudes have to be drunk. And Peter steps out. I call Peter the big mouth disciple. He was always taking his foot out of his mouth because he was always saying things that he didn't need to say. But on this occasion, because he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, he finally didn't have to take his foot out of his mouth because the Holy Spirit was directing him on what he should say. You never have to worry about what you're going to say when it's the Holy Spirit saying it through you. Peter gets up on the balcony and says, man, we ain't drunk, man. It's just nine o'clock in the morning. But let me tell you about this man I know named Jesus. And at that moment, 3,000 people got saved that day because Peter emboldened us with the power of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't just okay with sitting back and being a Jesus believer anymore. He had to profess the good news about who Jesus was so that somebody else could get the blessing that he was already blessed with. We pick up the story in Acts chapter 3 as Peter and John, man, they're just going about their business. They're going to the temple of worship as they always have. And this man that was uh, a cripple since birth, he found himself at this gate called Beautiful that people would bring him to every day. And this is where our story takes off. Peter and John, they were blessed by Jesus, and they used that blessing to go and be a blessing to the rest of humanity. They were blessed to be a blessing. See, I found the fastest way to see the gospel of Jesus Christ spread is to do what he did. Help somebody. Help somebody. What does the Bible say? James 2, 14 through 17 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister without clothes and daily food, if one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical need, what good is it? In the same way, 
faith itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Some of you have heard it said like this, faith without works is dead. We cannot talk Jesus unless we are willing to live Jesus in the society that we live in because this society is full with a bunch of people that know how to talk but don't know how to do what he said. It's not okay just to talk about how great he is and then not do anything to show people how great he is. I love what Proverbs 3, 27 and 28 says. It says, do not withhold good from those whom it is due what is in your power to act. Don't say to a neighbor, come back tomorrow, I'll give it to you, when you already have it with you. You have the greatest resource of all of existence living on the inside of you. But the Bible tells us that the same power that conquered the grave, that conquered death, it lives on the inside of you. But yet so many people of this generation walk around like we have nothing to offer. I believe if you really want to show Jesus, you got to give what you got. You got to do what he did. Every time we ever saw Jesus walk on this earth, every story that we ever read, what he had, he always gave. He was always willing to reach out and help somebody. You got to start really taking an honest inventory of your life. If you call yourself a Christ follower, you have to start asking yourself, how many people have you helped along the way? I'm sorry, this might not be the shouting message. It might really be a conviction message. That's okay because Jesus was grace and truth. I will not be a preacher that just preaches grace. I'm going to preach the truth part of it too. People might not want to hear the truth, but Jesus was both things. So I'm going to give you both sides of who he was because if I don't give you the truth, I'm doing more harm than good. So here's some things to consider when you're thinking about helping people. There's a couple things from this story. I'll be quick, and then we can go. The first thing is this. Are you willing to see the problem? Are you willing to see the problem? Have you ever seen a problem that was really hard to look at? I've definitely been faced with issues and problems that were very hard. To, if I was being real honest with myself, they were just hard to look at. You say, I don't know what that feels like. Yes, you do. It's probably happened to you before. Maybe you're in your car. And you're driving. And right before you're about to turn on the expressway, you're at an intersection. And you get stopped at a stoplight. And when you get stopped there, you see a person. And they got a sign. And they look like they got a problem. And you know what you do? They start to walk over to you. And you know what you do? Instead of keeping your eyes on the road like you usually do, you do this. <laughs> like all of a sudden, you got some stuff in your cup holder that need to get adjusted. All, 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 <laughs> all, all of a sudden, was, was, was that my phone? You don't want to look at what's the front. <laughs> because you don't want to look at what's real. You want to take your eyes off of the things that, that matter because those problems seem like this. And it's like, <laughs> it makes me laugh. Like, I, I, I promise, and my kid calls me out because I, I've made a, I've set a precedent in my life. If I see somebody, I don't care. Here, first of all, let, let me just say this. Don't worry about what their intention is. <laughs> some people don't give because it's like, no, nah, take my money and go get some more alcohol and get more drugs. And like, you've, you've created a story about this person and you have no idea who they are. You have no idea what they've been through. No idea what God is working on them with. No idea what they possibly have already been saved from, but you already put a, 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 a notion about who they are because you find it too hard to look at their problem. Don't worry about what they're going to do with what you give. Give. You give. So I keep a little change in my, in my, in my cup holder. 
my baby girl's in the car. If I, if I forget, if I ain't got no change, so daddy, you're not going to help? Like, she knows. Because I set, I set a precedent. Wilson's help people. That's what we do. We don't worry about what they're going to do when they get it. We worry about what we're going to do when we see the problem. It's funny, like, like you don't feel bad because, like, like I, I ain't trying to make fun of the situation, but I, this happened to all of us. So, like, you, you, like you want to help, but, like, they give you the guilt look. They come to you like this. <laughs> and they wait, like, an awkwardly long. <laughs> I was like, yo, son, I really ain't got no change today. Like, I really don't. Like, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you in the day, like, are you willing to look at the problem? Turning your eye away from the problem doesn't take the problem away. Are you willing to see the problem? What do you do when you're faced with a problem? What do you do? Look, look, look at what the disciples did. Acts 3, 4 through 5. It says, I love, oh man, this is so good. I want you to grab this. Peter looked straight at him. He looked straight at him, as did John. John wasn't trying to shy away from it either. He said, look at us. Not only did he look at the problem, he made the problem look back at him. Oh, my goodness, that could preach. <laughs> I ain't even got no time. So <laughs> the man gave them his attention, expecting something from them. Peter and John saw past the problem to the heart of the person. When the problem is in front of you, do you look at the problem or do you look at the person? The truth is we can't take our eyes off of people because if you feel overwhelmed enough that you cannot look at their problem, well, then how do they feel? They're living at it. They're, they're, they got to live with it every day. You feel bad? Oh, it's too hard again. They got to live with that. Don't focus on their problem. Focus on the person because behind every problem, there's a person. You see, we got this tendency to look at people the way that we want to look at people, but we always got to see people the way that God sees people, not for their issues, for who he made them to be. That's how we got to start seeing people. Just because they're different from you does not change the fact that God created them and they are people. Maybe they're going through a situation that you feel like may never, ever, ever happen to you. And I pray you never say never in your entire life because when you think that something won't happen to you, you make yourself a susceptible target for that thing to actually happen to you. Not trying to wish anything wrong on anybody, but I'm just saying anything can happen to anybody. Live long enough and see what life does to you. But you got to be better about if you are seeing people instead of their problems. You, you, you say, well, what are you talking about? You, you see the girl that walks in and her outfit is provocative and you think because she walk a certain way and talk a certain way. Oh, that's that stripper girl. I know her. No, it's not. That's Michelle. <laughs> Michelle is a single mom. And for whatever reason, with the way that she was raised and the way that she was brought up and the life circumstances that happened to her, she feels as if, it may not be true, but she feels as if the only way that she can make money to get through school and take care of her baby is to sell herself because nobody ever told her that she was so valuable that she never had to do that. Don't see the stripper, you see Michelle. You say, oh man, that's that, that's, uh, that's that dope boy, that's that drug dealer. No, that's not. It's Bobby, man. Bobby, he made some mistakes in his past. He got locked up for it. He was supposed to be rehabilitated. But the system that was designed to rehabilitate him did not rehabilitate him. They actually turned him into an animal, let him loose on the streets. And because he had a record and he was trying to get his life right, nobody wanted to give him a job. And because nobody wanted to give him a job, guess what he did? He went back to doing what he was doing before when he got in jail in the first place. And now we see him as this drug dealer that messes up the community when really he was just a person that was looking for an opportunity to be better that nobody gave him. It's not a dealer. It's just Bobby, man. Or, uh, I don't know, maybe it's that homeless guy. <laughs> it's not, not the homeless guy. That's Mark. Mark's a good dude. 
Mark, he worked for everything he ever had in his life, never asked anybody for a dime. But because of a recession, because the place of his employment was going out of business and it was the only thing that he'd ever done, he lost his job. He was laid off. He's been trying to get one, but he can't. So eventually, he had to resort to sleeping in his car because he lost everything. Eventually, that car stopped working, and you find him on the street. And when he comes up to your window, you think he's just one of those homeless people. And really, he was a guy that tried to do the right things. But man, life took a really bad turn. But we don't see him for his issues. We 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 need to see him for the man of God that he really is, because he really loves Jesus. And when he hit, when he reads that sign, when he has that sign that says "God bless you," I need some help. He actually really really needs it. And and he really, really means well, and he really, really needs some help, but we cannot see him for who he is because we only see him for his problem. We got to see past people's problems to see who they are. See, people got some serious issues, but the issues don't go away just because you choose not to look at them. You see the problem. You give your full attention to the problem. And not only do you give your attention to the problem, you see past that problem and you give your attention to the person. You know what that's called? That's called compassion. So what Jesus Christ had on each and every one of us, you said, what do you mean? Look at Matthew 9, 36. I'm not making it up. This is Jesus. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. When I'm staring in the face of a problem, I don't want the problem or the person to see me. I want them to see Jesus. You say, well, why is that? Because here's what I found. That when you see a problem and you stare directly into that problem, first of all, if the problem sees you, it's going to continue to be a problem. But if the problem looks back at you and sees Jesus, it knows it has to get out of the way. And when the problem gets out of the way, you know what it does? It opens up the person's eyes not to see you, but to see the God that is living on the inside of you. And his name is Jesus. And when that person does not see you and they see Jesus, you know what they see? They see love. They see hope. They see peace. I'm here to tell somebody that we got to treat people the right way. We have to look at people not for their problems, but we have to continue to look for them as people. Because when you are a person that has Jesus Christ living on the inside of you, and people, when you can direct their attention back at the Jesus in you, they do not see their cancer. They see their healing when they look at you. They do not see their bills. They see debt cancellation when they look at you. They don't see their mess. They see a miracle when they look at you. Because when they look at you, they don't see you because all the attention has been drawn to Jesus. If you believe it, say amen. amen. I'm always going to be a person that does not focus on people's problems, but focus on the people behind the problem. I want them to look right at me. And I pray to God that when they see me, they can see the face of Jesus. Because when they see the face of Jesus, they got hope. Do you see the problem? Here's something else to consider. Not only do you see the problem, but will you be willing to give what you have when you see the problem? <laughs> I, was, uh, I was out one night, and I, I, I came to a realization, and this is just something that we, we all have probably thought at one point or another. I, I don't think it's always that people don't want to give. I just think a lot of people don't realize what they have to give. I was out one night. I was driving around the city. And um, it was late. I was coming home. You know how you get to a gas station when it's so late that, like, there's no cashier at the gas uh, station anymore? Like, they got the doors locked, and they just like, ah, oh, you on your own. You better use the pump and pay at the pump. And, you know, praise God. I hope you still stay alive when you're done. Okay. So, anyways, it was one of those scenarios, and I was in the city. It was what it was. I'm from Carroll City, so I ain't scared of nothing. <laughs> Born and raised in the county of day. Holla at your boy. Me and Rick Ross is homies. All right, for real, we not, but hopefully we are one day. Hey, man, hope you watch him. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was out. I was pumping gas. I couldn't go to the cashier, so I pulled out my car because I didn't have any cash. Put out my car. I swiped it. I started pumping gas. I started pumping gas. I'm the only one at the gas station. 
but I'm not really the only one at the gas station. Somebody else at the gas station. Matter of fact, he probably lives at the gas station. So he started walking up to me. And as I said, okay, I know what this about to be. Um, so <laughs> here's what it is. You know what I'm saying? It's all good. Uh, so he came up. And he, he honestly, man, he, he looked like he was just living out on, on the street for years. Once again, this is me uh, assuming and making up a story in my head about who this person was, you know. Uh, so, so, so he comes up. He's like, hey, man, you got some money? I'm like, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, see, uh, what happened was, see, I was about to fix my mouth to say I didn't have anything. Because I didn't. Like, I had, I had, like, my card. I was like, yo, I can't get this man my debit card. Like, that's, that's going to be a mess. Like, I can't do that. Like, I ain't got no change. Like, I... Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was about, my, oh, my wife would be real mad. Okay, yeah, so I, I was about to fix my mouth to say, man, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so, I'm so sorry, man. I ain't got, if I, you know, if I had something, you know, if I had something, you ever been there, you know, if I had something, 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 if I had something, you know. So I was about to fix my mouth to, to, to say that, to say that. And, and then I, I, I had a thought. I had a thought. Now, don't, don't laugh at me. I, I am probably, my wife will attest to this, I'm probably the most overprepared person on the planet. And this is because, don't laugh, I was a royal ranger. <laughs> don't hate. That's all right. Some of y'all don't know what that is. It was a Christian Boy Scouts, okay? That's what it was. I used to come in church. I used to salute all that stuff. I used to wear a uniform to church every Sunday. It was always embarrassing. And then I got to I got to like high school and realized like yo this ain't cool no more like I gotta <laughs> stop. So I was a Royal Ranger, and uh, the the motto of Royal Ranger is we're ready, ready for anything, ready to work, play, serve, obey, worship, live, etc. What does the etc. mean? Like what, what are we talking about? It's like I guess anything. Okay, so I'm ready. Um, my my, my brother who was in the military, this story is going on so many ta tangents. He gave me. <laughs> He gave me uh, one of his sleeping bags uh, from when he was in the military. So this is like a really nice, like, military sleeping bag. It was, like, really dope. So I, I, for me, like, instead of just, like, putting it in my garage or something, I was like, I'm going to keep this in my truck because I don't know. I might. I might get stuck somewhere. And if I get stuck, at least I'd be able to roll out my sleeping bag and I could sleep. Like, bro, just sleep in your car. Like, what you need a sleeping bag for? Okay. I don't know. Don't worry about my thought process. Y'all don't mind me, okay? So I was, I was ready, though. So I had it. And I was about to fix my mouth to say, yo, you know if I had it. You know what I'm saying? You know if I had it. You know, and I had the thought. I said, wait. Silver and gold I do not have, my friend. But what I do have, I give you. And I pulled out this sleeping bag from my truck, and I put this big old sleeping bag, he had a cart, I put the sleeping bag in his cart, you would have thought this man won the lottery, this man went crazy, and I don't, tell, listen, I'm not here to tell these stories to big myself up, here's what I am willing to tell you, and here's what I'm trying to tell you, is that every time that you think you don't have something, there's always something for you to offer, see, you are a Christian, Here's what you have to understand about yourself. There's always something you have to offer. No, silver and gold, maybe you do not have, but what you do have, you need to freely give what you got in the name of Jesus because what you have in Jesus on the inside of you is going to do more for somebody than a dollar amount can do on this side of heaven. Give what you have. Stop worrying about what your account looks like. People, people say this thing, and I know young adults, we feel some kind of way about it. They talk about us as givers. I ain't getting nothing. Well, man, we young. We ain't got no money. Like, I've been to college. I ain't had no money, man. <laughs> like, I, I get it. Like, and honestly, it, it's, it's, it's funny that we don't talk about this more biblically, but you really have to think about it. Peter and John were saying silver and gold I, I do not have. Now, okay, we know they had a job. They were, they were fishermen. But we have to think about the context of the age that they were. Jesus Christ died at age 33, which means more than likely his disciples were all young adults. It was people the same age as people in this room. You ain't got no money. Guess what? Disciples probably had no money neither because they were young. See, in Jewish culture, to be considered a man, you don't have to be 21. When them boys have a bar mitzvah, they turning up. Oh, man, oh, man, now, mazel tov. You know what I'm saying? 
At 18, back in those days, they would have gotten married. And they would have taken a wife that was much younger. The only disciple that we know, that we know, that we know for a fact that had a wife was Peter. All he had to do was be 18 to have that. So we, we don't even know how truly young these disciples were. So for them saying they had money, they, they didn't have money, they didn't allow that to be the excuse for them not to give. What they did have, they gave in the name of Jesus. Don't use that as, I'm, I'm too young, I ain't got nothing. Give what you got. Yeah, I find out the problem, though. <laughs> I, I feel... I, 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 I figured it out. I figured it out. See, the problem is we all got Jesus. But too many of us hold on to him and we're not willing to share what we have. Didn't Jesus die for all of us? Didn't die for some of us. Not for all of us. So if we got him, we should give him. See, people hold on to Jesus like they have nothing to offer. When you offer Jesus, it's the greatest thing on the planet that you could ever offer. You're giving somebody something that will last eternally. There's no dollar amount you could give to sustain a person forever. Because though they may feel like they're okay on this side of heaven, if they haven't accepted Jesus and they don't have that, they're not going to be okay on the other side. You always have something to give, but... Here's what I will say about this young adult mentality. Maybe we get a bad rap for not giving, but here's what I will say. I think sometimes we deserve a bad rap because what we do have, we don't give. What we do have, you, you, you say, you say, what, what, what are you, what, what are you, what are you talking about? I think the pe people hold on to Jesus like they have nothing to offer, and those are the same people that walk in the church each and every week, and they say, I'm not being fed. Hey, I'm really nice. I'm nicer than this. So if, if this is your first time and like you're, listen, I come back next week. I promise you, I'll do more grace next week. This is the truth week. I'll do more grace. Okay. So what are you talking about? Those people always complain about being spiritually fed. I don't think, I don't think you getting food is the problem. I, I, I think you, spiritually, I think you getting fed a lot. I don't think you're spiritually fed. I think you're spiritually fat. I'm going to sip my tea. Where's Kermit at? <laughs> Pinky's up. I'm spiritually fed. You're just taking in. Every week, cameraman going to be real mad at me. You sit there. Oh, that's a good word. Oh, that's a good word. Oh, that one was for me. Oh, that's a good word. That's a good word. That's a good word. Mm, mm. That's a good word. Mm, mm. That's a good word. Mm, mm. That's a good word. 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 Okay. How many good words you gonna get? You ain't fool yet. You getting good word after 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 good word each and every week, and then you go from Monday. All the way back to Saturday without telling one person something that was good. You don't have a problem being spiritually fed. You're just spiritually fed. You hold on to what you have. But the Bible tells us this. Freely you have received. Freely you must give. See, God is less concerned about you hearing a good word and more concerned about you doing a good work. Some people are so concerned about a good word that they're not concerned about doing a good work at all. You say, well, well, that's not biblical. Yes, it is. It's the passage I read to you at the beginning. Faith without works is dead. You want to hear a good word. That's important. Why? Because faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing the word of God. Some of y'all are full of faith. 
but you're dead as a Christian because you've done nothing with it. I promise you I'll be nicer next week. I promise you I will. Bless up. It's not okay just to hear. It's not okay just to receive. Eventually, you must do. We got to... Man. It's frustrating even giving a word like this because I'm not trying to be the bad guy. I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says. I'm tired of seeing my generation get picked on because people saying we're not doing enough. Your hashtag ain't enough. The shirt you're wearing that say this and that, it's not enough. When are you going to do, like, like people bounce from church to church to church in search of a good word when all you got to do is stay planted in the house of the Lord and the Bible tells you that you will flourish. You go from conference to conference to conference, and I love conferences. We're going to throw another conference, but Jesus didn't die for conferences. Jesus died for people. Gotta get past this place where we are spiritually fat because when you are spiritually fat, you are useless. Will you give what you have received? It's not only that, are you willing to touch people? This whole this whole thing about receiving. And giving, knowing that we have a power in Jesus Christ. If you're, if you're not willing to give what you already have, here's just what I want to tell you. That resource and power without usage is useless. You got a lot of faith, but you ain't doing nothing. So, with that being said, are you willing to touch people? Are you willing? What, what does that mean? I, I don't want it to get weird, but Acts 3, 7 says, Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's ankles became strong. Taking him by the right hand, picked him up, and instantly, let's be honest, there are some problems that we have seen that we won't touch. <laughs> oh, man. I've been watching them too for a long time. That marriage is too far gone. I ain't touching that. That dude, he's crazy. He should probably be Baker acted. He needs professional help. I ain't touching that. That girl, she all over the place. I mean, people have Spoke to her before, but she's still just doing whatever she wanted to do. She messy. I ain't, I ain't touching that. Do you know the legal ramifications of what he did? That's, yo, he ain't going to mess around and get life. I ain't touching that. Um, They're living a certain lifestyle that is counterculture to my faith. And if people see me with them, I ain't touching that. I ain't touching that. So many things that we have seen that we are not willing to touch, but Peter and John had to physically touch the man that they helped. They had to lizard, physically. Believers can't be scared to get our hands dirty. They can't be. Now, I'm not, I'm, listen, I'm not advocating that everybody in here needs to run into every situation. Like, I'm not telling the dude in here to go to Tootsie's right now. I'm like, I'm going to get all these girls saved. That's dumb. <laughs> That's just dumb. That's just dumb. That's just dumb. It's dumb. It's dumb. Dumb. Nobody's that safe. It's dumb. Okay? I'm not saying that. But if God, if God, it's dumb. If, if God, if Jesus lives on the inside of you and he has blessed you, he has equipped you and empowered you to walk into certain situations that nobody else can walk into. 
But you got to be willing to get your hands dirty. You can't just see a problem and say, mm, that's too messy. I don't want to touch that. Like, what if Jesus would have did that to you? In context of Jesus, all of our lives are messy. But I'm so thankful that we serve a Savior that no matter how messy our life was, he was willing to touch us. See, you have to understand, he touched the cripple. He touched the blind. He touched the lepers. Jesus even touched the dead. A rabbi was forbidden to touch the dead. He was breaking the law, but Jesus I love him because he's so smart. Even when it looked like he was breaking the law, he didn't break the law because he sent his word forth to that tomb before they sealed up that tomb. And he said, this sickness will not end in death. So even when he touched Lazarus, Lazarus wasn't even dead. He was just resting. I want you to understand today, we serve a God that's always willing to get messy. Are you? Are you willing to get messy for others? Sometimes, man, people in situations so bad, and you know they just need a touch. They just need, man, I, I've been, to, I, I've been to, uh, man, 12 years of being a pastor. I've, I've conducted a, a lot of funerals, or I've, I've been to hospital rooms when, when people are on their last uh, leg. Man, I've seen a lot of, like, heavy stuff, man, that you, you take with you for the rest of your life. You don't, it doesn't leave you. And I learned this from Pastor Rich years ago. He said, the best thing you could do in a situation, you don't have to say a word. Because sometimes, man, there's just nothing you could say. Like, if I was in that situation, I wouldn't, know, I wouldn't know what to do. Sometimes we just try to, like, talk a game like, oh, you will be all right, and stop your tears in the name. No, the Bible says there's a time to cry. There's a time to mourn. It's okay. Y'all ain't got to be so saved that you're not human. Pastor Rich always was telling me, he said, Terrence, you're going to get in situations where you will be at loss for words. But you just put an arm around their shoulder. They just need to know that you're there. They just need a touch. Man, I don't, I don't know who came in this room. I don't know what you're dealing with. But, man, everybody at some point or another can be encouraged by a touch. We all need a touch from God. Amen? Let's do something real practical right now. Because I love what the Bible says. It says this. It says in Matthew 18, 19, it says, Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything and ask for it, it shall be done by my Father in heaven. Agreement. What does a touch look like? It's agreement. I want you to look at your neighbor right now. I don't care if you like him or you don't like him. Maybe you want to touch him on the shoulder. Maybe you want to grab your hand. For the next 20 seconds, we're going to pray. What you going to pray about? Don't pray about yourself. Pray about them. You don't even need to know their name. Just begin to pray. Come on, let me hear you. Some, I want the person next to you to hear the encouraging things that you're saying about them. Just pray. Pray. I'm going to pray. Father God, I pray right now. I pray for my brothers and sisters that are just looking for a touch. God, I pray that you would encourage them in whatever dark situation that they're going through. God, as we are touching and agreeing, I pray that encouragement is already spreading throughout the body. There was a person in here that did not know that somebody would lay hands on them and pray, but I pray right now that they would feel the grace of God, that they would feel the power of God, that they would feel the mercy of God, that they would feel the love of God in this situation. We declare it in Jesus' name and everybody said how many of y'all feel better because somebody just prayed for you? There's something about a touch. Certain situations are hard to look at, but some situations are hard to touch. But are you willing to get messy for the people that need it the most? Here's the last thing. I'm going to say, will people be willing to see Jesus because of you? Acts 3, 8 through 10 says, he, he is the crippled man, jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them to the temple courts. Walk. He jumped to his feet. This man has been crippled since birth. If you read later on in Acts, you find out that that man was over 40 years old. I love that because when the power of God comes on a situation, 
problems that lasted 40 years, problems that lasted 10 months, problems that lasted 10 years, problems that lasted 10 minutes, they get healed in a day. An instant. 40-year-old problem going like that in the name of Jesus. I love this. It says, he jumped to his feet and began to walk. And he went with them into the temple courts, walking. He wasn't just walking, y'all. says he was jumping and praising who? Didn't say he was praising Peter and John, did it? You want to talk about thankfulness? He knew where his help came from. Praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, I love this. They recognized him. As the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they, they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. They were, when they saw the joy of Jesus in somebody else, they, they were filled. See, we have to realize that what we do will say everything about Jesus that people need to know. Gandhi said it like this. I like your Christ. I don't like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Why? Because we're not willing to give what we got. Jesus was always willing to give what he had. The question is to you, what are your actions saying about Jesus? Literally, people are falling away from the faith because of our actions or lack thereof. And everything we do, we need to give the world a reason to jump and shout about who Jesus is. Every single thing we do. See, when you help somebody, people will take notice. Because guess what? The person that you helped, there are other people that you don't know that know him or that know her. And when that person goes jumping and walking and shouting back into their circle of influence. The people that know them and know what they're about and be like, yo, what's gotten into you? I know you for 40 years and I ain't never seen you act like this before. So what has come over you? And when that person says, Jesus, they are opening a door. They are planting a seed for Jesus Christ to get into somebody else's life. They're giving what they got. I, I, I love this. Because the rest of the story goes like this. The authorities at the time, they got angry because this man was jumping and talking about Jesus. So Peter and John, they get arrested. And man, in, in, in the temple courts, Peter and John, they preach a message once again about Jesus. They get shackled. They get taken away. That man won't stop praising. But look what happens in Acts 4, 3 through 4. It says, they seized Peter and John because it was evening. And they put them in jail until the next day. I love this. But I love when God's up to something because there's always a but in front of it. Many people who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The church grew because they gave what they had. Who knew that helping one crippled man would see the church grow to 5,000 people that day? See, as believers, we need to show Jesus more than we preach Jesus. We got to show him more than we preach him. Why? What does the Bible say? This is how you know what love is. And Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can that person say that the love of God is in them? Dear children, let us not love with our words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Give what you got. Love, real love, is shown in action. Are you willing to give what you have to someone else? I heard about a story of a kid. He was 16 years old at the time. And he had been going to a church for a while. Honestly, his whole life, he'd been going to a church. And um, he 
uh, the church went through some stuff and they changed pastors. And the kid was there, you know, he was there because his family was there. His mom was there, his brother was there, his sister was there. His dad really wasn't a believer at all, but, you know, mama kept him in church all the time, so he was always there. Anyways, the young man, he had never really um, taken a liking to pastors as much because he never really got close to one. He was around church. He knew all the right things to say in church. He did and said all the right stuff, but he, re he never really had a connection with the people that he probably should have had a connection with, which were his pastors, the people that were supposed to love him and, and, and guide him and mentor him. Well, this new pastor came in town, and he just figured, yeah, he'd be, he'd be like all the rest. He'll do the same things that everybody else did. He'll, you know, preach on the pulpit, but he, you know, he won't know me. I'll just be a face in the crowd, you know. That's what the kid was saying to himself. And the pastor came. It didn't take long. The pastor was the kind of person that would just introduce himself to everybody, you know, shake every hand, smile at every person. And the young man introduced himself to the pastor. He said his name and hadn't talked to each other in a while. You know, it just kind of was what it was. And then one day the pastor came back. And when the pastor talked to him again, he remembered his name. It shocked him. He was like, no way. You got all these people in this church and you, you remember me? Like little old me? Like it really messed him up. So he didn't think too much about it. But it just happened to be that the year that that man that young man uh, was 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 going through all this stuff and the year that that pastor had come to the church it was this man's senior year in um in high school so what ended up happening was that the young man was about to leave and go off to college and the sunday before he was about to go that same pastor who he you know thought was actually a really nice guy cuz he remembered his name he he called him up at the altar after a message all the people wanted to talk to him, but he called him out by name and grabbed a young man. He hugged him and he gave him a what we like to call in the Pentecostal world a Holy Ghost handshake, Pentecostal handshake. Gave him a Pentecostal handshake, and when he did that, he left some money in the young man's hand. Um, the young man walked away from that situation because um, the pastor said to him, "Hey, I believe in you. I believe in your future, and man, hopefully this will get you started in your dreams." It shocked the young man because the young man had family and he had family members that weren't even as nice to him as the young pastor was. And it really tripped him out because he was willing to invest in his dream, even though a lot of people weren't. Well, that young man, he went to college. He got several degrees. Finally, he came home. When he came home, that young man felt the call to be a pastor. And when he came home, his pastor that had blessed him was still the pastor of that church. He gave him a position on staff. He's been pastoring, pastoring him and been mentoring him ever since. That young man was me. Nineteen years ago, our dear pastor blessed me when people I thought in my life that should have blessed me, he blessed me when they didn't. He saw something in me that I didn't see myself and I always said one day one day man I'm going to return the favor I had no idea i have become a pastor in this house I ran from it for a really long time but today I get to be here I get to challenge you I get to love on you I get to bless you because somebody blessed me You gotta give what you got. Because though it might not have been much to him, it was everything for me. It was everything for me. You never know the little things that you do in somebody's life. It could mean the world to them. It could literally change the entire course of their life because you chose to give. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. With every head back.